ask you please to take your seats. We're going to begin in about one minute. For everyone getting food, we're going to give it one more minute, and there are some seats right up here in the front for any eager beavers who want to sit up there. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Lori Sanders, and on behalf of the academic programs team here at AEI, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for coming out. We're glad that you came out to hear what I think promises to be one of the most incredibly interesting talks that you hopefully hear during your internship in Washington. So first, a little business. Please silence your cell phones. Please refrain from getting up to refill your plates or your drinks while Dr. Murray is speaking this evening. The reception will reopen when he's done. Um, and as Dr. Murray takes questions, please wait for a microphone to reach you, and please identify yourself with your university or your place of internship before you ask a question. Um, if you have any questions to get about how to get involved with AEI student programs, please don't hesitate to ask us. There are several of us walking around with blue stars on our name tags, um, and we can answer any questions you may have about being involved with AEI. After Dr. Murray wraps up, our director of academic programs will close by giving some quick remarks about our programs. But now for the fun stuff. I'm incredibly excited to have you all here to discuss what's probably honestly my favorite book that I've read in recent years. So let me explain why. I, like most of you, I think had my first real DC experience when I studied here during college. And needless to say, coming from small town, rural Georgia, it was a bit of a culture shock. I went from somewhere where NASCAR and what was happening in the race on Sunday was the most prevalent topic of conversation to being at a party on Thursday night where we held a moment of silence because we had just received word that Chief Justice William Rehnquist had died. Needless to say, I don't think many people from my high school actually knew who William Rehnquist was before he died. And this was shocking to me. I went from going to Waffle House every Friday night to going to Chopped, going to Nando's Peri Peri. What is Peri Peri Chicken, by the way? I'm still not really sure. But it was just an amazing shock to me that there was this whole different lifestyle than what I had experienced in Georgia. Um, but beyond those seemingly silly cultural differences of what we talk about or what we eat, there's a deeper difference that's harder to put its finger on. Now that I live here, it's a little bit easier to say what it is. In my hometown, there's a poverty rate of over 30% of the population. The median household income is $28,000 per year, and one of the leading indicators, or one of the leading reasons for that is the fact that 26% of family households are led by single parents. 
in the town where I now live, which Dr. Murray will refer to as a super SIP, um, the median household income is $81,000. Less than 9% of households are headed by single parents. And I honestly love my hometown dearly, and the, these statistics sort of gloss over what is an unspoken problem of cultural decline in towns like mine. I, it's always something that really bothered me, and it seemed to me that for all of the talk in Washington, D.C. about economic inequality or all the finger pointing over the breakdown of the family and high divorce statistics, nobody really seemed to understand what was going on until enter Charles Murray and his recent wonderful book, Coming Apart. So Charles Murray is the W.H. Brady Scholar at, here at AEI. His most recent book, Coming Apart, describes an unprecedented divergence in American classes over the last half century. He first came to national attention in 1984 with his publication of Losing Ground, which was credited as the intellectual foundation for the Welfare Reform Act of 1996. His 1994 New York Times bestseller, The Bell Curve, co-authored with the late Richard Herrnstein, sparked controversy for its analysis of the role of IQ in shaping America's class structure. His other books include What It Means to Be a Libertarian, Human Accomplishment, In Our Hands, and Real Education. And I hope that you all get as much of an education as I have from listening to Dr. Charles Murray this evening. Welcome. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I bet you scored really high on the bubble quiz. Got to be in the 60s or 70s, right? Uh, but why don't you sound like you came from a small town in Georgia? That's what I want to know. I'm going to talk about uh, coming apart tonight, but I'm going to do a selective uh, presentation for a couple of reasons. One is that a couple of you, I think, have been at previous presentations I have given, and it drives me nuts to think there are people in the audience who've heard all of my jokes already. Uh, and another reason is that this audience is sort of red meat for me. Uh, you are the people I would really like to talk to the most about your lives and what's happening to the country. And all of that is focused on the first part of Coming Apart, uh, not the other part. Very briefly, Coming Apart has, is split into three sections. You've got uh, the first uh, part is the formation of a new upper class, the second part is the formation of the new lower class, and the third part is why it matters. Uh, the, the second part, the formation of the new lower class, I'm just not going to talk about tonight, except to say very quickly what Laurie uh, alluded to in her opening remarks. There has been a cultural deterioration in the working class in the United States of America that has nothing to do with race uh, because it's uh, prevalent among non-Latino whites just as it is among uh, Latinos and blacks and minorities. Uh, and, and this cultural deterioration is fundamentally changing the capacity of the working class to participate in the institutions of American life. I will content myself with a single solitary number or pair of numbers from, uh, from, from the whole second part of the book. So this is all you're going to get from about five chapters of uh, dense uh, technical material. Uh, marriage. Central social institution, central cultural institution, especially central to a, co a country like the United States, which uh, historically said communities will solve their own problems. How do communities solve their own problems? They do it with the family as the fundamental building block. In 1960, just about everybody who was a prime age adult, meaning 30 to 49, was married. 94% of those in the upper middle class were married, 84% of those in the working class were married. I'm referring specifically to whites here, by the way, non-Latino whites, as I do throughout the book, to get rid of all of the complications associated with race. In any, in any case, you had, in 1960, on this central institution, it was the overwhelming norm in communities throughout the country. 2010, 84% of, uh, of whites in the upper middle class are still married. It's actually even better than that. There was a decline in marriage from uh, 1960 until the early 1980s in the upper middle class, from 94% to 84%, but it's been steady in, at 84 85% ever since. And furthermore, di divorce has declined. So in uh, 2012, we have a higher proportion of those marriages or first marriages than 20, 25 years ago. That's great. In the white working class, the percentage of prime age adults who are married is now 48%. That's 30 to 49, when everybody's supposed to be married. It, it's, it's, if you go back and think about social trends over time and the way they change, you will be very hard put to come up with 
an indicator which has shown such a huge divergence between classes over such a short period of time, historically speaking. So the, the, the problem of the new lower class is serious. Um, it deserves our attention, but tonight I want to focus on the new upper class because that's where most of you have either come from or are heading toward. What do I mean by upper class and what's new about the new upper class? Because the United States has always had an upper class. We've always, by upper class, I don't mean socialites in New York. Uh, I don't mean the 400. I don't mean Beacon Hill in Boston. Uh, by upper class, I'm referring to the most successful professionals and managers in the country. Specifically, I define them as the most successful 5% of those who are in managerial or uh, professional positions, the, mo the most successful 5% of lawyers, of physicians, of, of uh, executives, and so forth. That's the broad elite, and that refers to places throughout the country. So Des Moines, Iowa has a, a, an upper class, and so does Wichita and Topeka. There is also a narrow elite, which is much, much smaller. These are people who have an effect on the nation's politics or culture or economy. And if you start to think about it, it's, it's a really small number. It's certainly no bigger than 100,000 people. And actually, I think it could be as low as 10,000, depending on how strict you want to be. I mean, think, for example, about um, journalism and influential columnists in the op-ed pages. At first glance, it seems like there are lots of them. But if you go through and, and get the names of all of those who really are important to the national dialogue, the, the Charles Krauthammers, the Paul Krugmans, uh, George Wills, and so forth, essentially you're talking about a matter of a few dozen who are really big time. And of those few dozen, the top 10 or 12 are much more influential than the next 10 or 12. The same thing goes for, uh, say, attorneys. How many attorneys are really important to the nation's politics, culture, and economy? Well, mostly they're concentrated in those areas which deal with constitutional jurisprudence. You're not talking about more than low hundreds of, of attorneys who, who have such an important role in taking cases before the appellate courts and the Supreme Court and so forth. So the, their, the narrow elite is uh, much smaller, and guess what? It is also very, very highly concentrated in just four major metropolitan areas. Washington, D.C., New York City, Los Angeles, and recently the fourth one is, is the uh, Silicon Valley Corridor, the stretching from San Francisco down to San Jose as the IT industry has become so much more important. If you're going to hold a nationally influential job, you pretty much have to live in one of those four places. There are exceptions, but not a whole lot of them. So that is what I mean by the new upper class. What's different about the new upper class now and the old upper class? The difference is that the new upper class has a culture all its own. Lori also alluded to that in, in, her, in her introduction. I will describe that culture in more detail later, even though just about everybody in this room lives in it. Um, but you can see whether my description corresponds to your own experience. But let me start out by talking about how things changed and why the new upper class now is different from the way it was before. Let us take, for example, that most elite of all elite institutions, Harvard University, my alma mater. You've heard of the SAT? Yes, I knew you did. And, and I bet even probably most of you can maybe remember your SAT scores, like to the point. Uh, I can remember mine, and it's been, what? 50 years since I took it. Um, in 1952, the mean SAT verbal score for the incoming class at Harvard was about 587. Those of you with SAT verbals in 587 did not apply to Harvard in this, uh, unless your father had given a $20 million building to Harvard, uh, or unless you were a really good football player or something. You, uh, you just didn't bother to apply because you don't get into Harvard with those kinds of scores. Actually, by 1960, just eight years later, uh, I should have this down to the point, but I'm, I'm, it's around 680. In effect, over eight years, Harvard went uh, up a standard deviation. Harvard went from a place that consisted of a lot of rich kids and some smart ones to a place where almost everybody was smart and some of them were still rich. Uh, the same thing happened at Yale, Princeton, Stanford, Columbia, 
Berkeley, uh, you name it, throughout the college system, over the 1950s, the system got much, much more efficient in identifying talent wherever it was, whether it was in Newton, Iowa, or small towns in Georgia, or wherever, and sucking it into the elite schools. This is great. By the way, just let me a little, do a little parenthesis here. We are all told that it's the 1960s in which we had these huge improvements in, in access. Well, we did have huge improvements in access for uh, African Americans. That's, there's no question about that. But if you're talking about when the real change took place, the one that had a huge effect on the nation's culture, that was the 1950s where it really took off. Okay, back to the main story. You had then this, this uh, wonderful effect. This is making good on the American dream. This is terrific. Uh, you are identifying talent and giving it a chance to blossom. And that is the story of a great deal of what I'm going to be saying to you tonight. It's not the result of evil policies. It's not the result of people doing bad things. It's the result of good changes and people doing what comes naturally that has produced collateral side effects that are very problematic. In the case of allowing all of this talent get together, what could possibly be the downside? Well, one thing that is, that is the downside has to do with the way that a group can maintain a separate culture distinct from the rest of the area. How do the Amish do it? They do it by forming local majorities in which they own all the land and they are the dominant force. And that's how the Amish have been able to preserve uh, th their, their culture. In terms of the new upper class, getting to gather all of these talented people is another way of saying you were getting to gather a whole bunch of very high IQ people. There are other talents beside IQ. I don't want to go through all of that argument. But IQ is sort of the, in, in terms of academic achievement, IQ is the all-purpose tool. And so you now had at universities uniformly very smart people. Uh, virtually everybody in this room is very smart. A whole lot of you in this room who went to ordinary public schools uh, or not very good public schools, probably when you got away and got to college and got to meet all of these other people who now finally got your jokes, were so happy. People that you could talk to about things and they wouldn't, they wouldn't tease you because of your vocabulary. Uh, they, wouldn't, uh, uh, they, they wouldn't be standoffish because they thought that you were a brainiac or whatever. All the ways in which you got to be around people who were like you and it was so wonderful. Okay, that's a perfectly natural way to react. But it's also true that grouped together you have distinctive tastes and preferences in jokes, in reading, and the rest of it. But now you're starting to form a critical mass. Uh, let me give you a quick example of that in terms of uh, where rich people live and the socioeconomic characteristics of those places. In 1960, as in 2010, there were places where Everybody knew the rich and powerful people lived. Upper East Side of New York, North Shore of Chicago, Beverly Hills, Bel Air, so forth, uh, Northwest Washington. I collected at the census tract level uh, census data for 19, from 1960 on the median family income in 14 of those very elite neighborhoods and also the percentage of adults who had college degrees. In 1960, in those very fancy neighborhoods, the median family income was $83,000. That's in 2010 dollars. Um, that's not rich. That's not even really affluent. That doesn't mean that there weren't rich people living in those neighborhoods. It means that in those neighborhoods there were a lot of people who weren't affluent. There was still a mix. In terms of college degrees, I think the more interesting statistic here, you went from only 26% with college degrees to something like 67%. Think about what 26% means. That means that the typical married couple in one of those highly elite neighborhoods uh, consisted either of uh, the guy having a college graduate and the, his wife having a high school diploma or both of them having high school diplomas you were guaranteed a whole lot of cultural diversity merely by the difference in the, uh, in the socialization that goes on in college. When you've got 67% who have college degrees, 
you have a completely different situation. The typical couple both have college degrees now. And furthermore, when you analyze who lives in those 14 neighborhoods, it's not just that they have college degrees from the University of Nebraska or from Coe College or from uh, Podunk. Uh, they tend to have degrees from the elite schools. They tend to have graduate degrees and law degrees and medical degrees and the rest, which further differentiates them from the rest of the country. Another thing happens when you bring all sorts of really talented people together, and that has to do with the economy. Over the course of the 20th century, brains became much more valuable in the marketplace. Just simple, raw brain power, independently of any other skills. The example I love to use for this is somebody with really, really high math skills who is a complete social klutz. Okay? <laughs> You've met them. Um, what could such a person do to make a living in 1920, let's say? He could be an actuary. If he could summon up a little bit of social presence, maybe he could be a math professor in, in a college. But that was about it. Take that same skill set today. Google and Microsoft, if th those math skills have been used for programming, which they oftentimes are, Google and Microsoft will be waving six-figure salaries in front of that same person. If the guy is really a genius of pure mathematics or something and a complete social klutz, a place like Renaissance Technologies or one of the other quant firms can reasonably promise him wealth beyond his wildest dreams if he goes to work for them. But the same thing has also happened with all the other professions. Way too many of you in this room are probably going to go to law school. Uh, the reason you are going to go to law school is because, uh, well, some of you are going there because it's an all-purpose tool. I'll come back to that later when I'm, ex <laughs> but when, when I'm excoriating you in various other ways. Um, but one of the reasons you're doing it is because uh, lawyers make good money. Why do they make good money? Why do you now have lawyers who can charge four figures per hour, uh, and a lot of them in a high three figures? You couldn't do that in 1920 or 1940 or 1950 because what did lawyers do at that time? Lawyers basically either were corporate lawyers, in which case they made corporate salaries, which were good but not fabulous, or they handled ordinary kinds of legal problems because that's what mostly lawyers did. The age of international mergers had not yet come about, uh, of very complex kinds of mergers and, and all the other legal instruments that we now have, we didn't have then. And Lord knows we didn't have anything like the regulatory labyrinth we have now, whereby a really smart lawyer, smart in the IQ sense, can navigate his way through the regulatory labyrinth and make a difference of millions of dollars to the bottom line of a corporation, and thereby be worth four figures an hour. Brains became much more valuable across the board throughout the 20th century. So we've got the most talented kids being sucked into the best schools. We have brains being worth a lot more. What happens? You have a lot of really smart people inhabiting elite neighborhoods. Furthermore, they're marrying each other. Uh, if you were a CEO in 1920, who did you marry? You married probably at age 22 or 23. That's when most people got married. And so you probably married uh, the girl next door or some uh, from, drawn from some other pool that is not deliberately highly screened for IQ. She wasn't a dummy, but neither was she in a situation where you knew very well she was in the top percentile or few percentiles of IQ. Who does the CEO marry now? First, he doesn't get married until 29, 30, 31, or later. And when he does get married, he doesn't get married to the girl next door. He gets married to the women he encounters in the course of his world. Who are those women? He's a Harvard MBA, let's say. She's a Yale PhD, uh, she's a Yale PhD or a Yale uh, law degree who uh, he encounters in the course of his business. He marries her. Why is that a big deal? Well, because whether it's because of genes or environment, doesn't make any difference which is involved, so don't get excited about genes at this point. The correlation between parental IQ, midpoint parental IQ, and the child's IQ is about 0.5, which is a quite substantial correlation. What that means is that the next generation of highly talented children have a much, much better chance of coming from a couple who both have IQs of 135 than a couple that both have IQs of 100 
or as happened in the old days in the new upper in the upper class families where maybe the uh, guy who became powerful I will say guy because in the old days they were almost always guys uh, he might have had an IQ of 135 but his wife had an IQ of 105 or 110 uh, so you have a case in which the the new upper class is a whole lot more tenacious than it used to be because it used to be you only pass down money and you know the, the old uh, phrase is shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. Uh, if you only pass down money, the kids aren't that smart, aren't that energetic, and they spend it all, and third generation you're back at work again. Uh, in this case, you're passing down talent along with, um, along with the money. You are also passing down a very enriched environment in many respects uh, that other children do not get. So that's how you end up with a kind of segregation that I'm talking about, in which we increasingly have enclaves of people who are rich, or affluent anyway, they are professionally very successful, they're extremely well educated, they're very high IQ, and they form a culture that is very distinct from that which goes on uh, in the rest of the country. And these form bubbles. Uh, I, I uh, took zip codes throughout the United States, and I created an index, which is a combination of uh, education of adults and median family income, and ranked all the zip codes in the country. Uh, uh, we are right now in a zip code that is in the top half of the top centile of that distribution. If you go from here, west and northwest, through the next 13 zip codes in northwest Washington and up into McLean and Potomac and uh, Bethesda and so forth, you're looking at, I think, uh, out of those 13, 10, are in the 99th percentile, okay? Actually, the bubble that this forms, where you have contiguous zip codes, the biggest bubble of all is in Washington, D.C., and it, 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 the area, and it's growing all the time. I updated my numbers from coming apart, which were taken from the 2000 census and did them for the 2010 census. And just in the course of those 10 years, the, uh, the, the super zips, meaning those in the top 5%, formerly stopped out in Fairfax County. And then west of there, you didn't have them. Now they go all the way into Loudoun County. Uh, what used to be, that used to be that there was a fairly sizable break in super zips uh, on 270 going north uh, on the east side of 270 uh, over until you got to some of the super zips around Columbia. Now that's pretty much all an arc of super zips. So you are not only living in a bubble if you were in Washington, D.C., and are not living in southeast D.C. or, uh, uh, you know, Suitland or, or Anacostia. If you're living in the parts of D.C. which almost all of you live in, you're living in the largest bubble in the United States in terms of the new upper class. What is this new culture that uh, I'm talking about? How is it so different? Well, a lot of you went to private schools or you went to really good public schools. So I ask you to think back to parents' night at your schools and then compare notes after the speech with uh, those like Lori who were in small Georgia schools. Here, I'll tell you what some of the differences are between, and or for that matter, the schools my kids went to out in Brunswick, Maryland. Um, first thing is, the parents uh, in the schools of the new upper class are lots skinnier than uh, everybody else. The, the statistics on obesity, uh, are, are horrendous. I can't remember exactly what they are, but something like 30, 40 percent of Americans are obese. Uh, that doesn't look that way in this room. I myself consider myself to be protesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm also getting old, which uh, is another excuse. But they're much skinnier, much, much skinnier. Why are they skinnier? Well, because they eat yogurt instead of bacon and eggs in the morning, and they do their Pilates and their yoga, and they cross-train, and they uh, wear uh, Fitbits on, in their pockets, which monitor how many steps they take every day and how many calories they burn. You know this story. A lot of you do exactly the same thing. It's good. It's healthy. Good for you. But it's different from the rest of the country. The parents in the new upper-class schools are also pretty geriatric. Uh, in an ordinary public school, most of the mothers will be in their 20s. Some will be in their 30s, of, of the, you know, the, the mothers of 6th graders and 5th graders, they'll, they'll be in their 30s, but, uh, but most, a lot of them are in their 20s. In a good private school or uh, a school in an affluent suburb, you're lucky if you've got 
mothers in their low 30s. Uh, a lot of them are going to be up in their high 30s. A lot of them are going to be in their 40s. Don't even ask about the fathers. Uh, you're not only talking 40s, you're talking 50s and sometimes a lot older than that. Uh, well, what difference does that make? It makes a huge difference in all sorts of things, some good and some bad. I mean, a, a, an older parent is by and large a more mature parent. That's good. Um, but it's also true that the relationship between a 13-year-old girl and a uh, 36-year-old mother is going to be different than the relationship between a 13-year-old girl and a 50-year-old mother in terms of being able to talk across the generations and in a variety of other ways. It's just very different family environments. You know, as if in terms of, uh, of, of other kinds of activities, you have older parents and you end up with different kinds of cultural phenomena. Television. Okay, I'm with a younger group now, so I don't know how this would play out. If this were an older group, I will tell you what I would get when I ask about television in the new upper class. One of the responses would be, well, you know, we actually don't have a television anymore. We got rid of it. Another one would be, well, we have a television, but gee, we, you know, we watch an occasional movie and DVD or, or download one on the net. Your more adventurous uh, new upper class families will watch Mad Men and Downton Abbey. And the really adventurous ones have perhaps watched Breaking Bad. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, they are completely oblivious to m the vast amount of stuff that's on TV. Uh, they have not watched Jersey Shore. They haven't the slightest idea who Snooky is. Um, and in doing so, they are oblivious to a great deal of what the rest of America is very much in tune with. The average number of hours that an American television set is on is 35. There are other trivial things. They're trivial individually. Uh, they add up. Uh, new upper class households despise American beer. They loathe American beer. They look down. They are contemptuous of American beer. Their beer is made by Belgian elves in, 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 in very small bottles. And uh, they, they, uh, they, they, they can talk a lot about wine. They know a lot about wine. Um, I can tell you as, as a statement of fact that when I am invited to the house of a new upper class and they ask what I'd like to drink, and I'll say I'll take a martini straight up, hold the vermouth, um, I get some shocked looks because they don't have any gin in the house because nobody would ever drink such a barbaric drink. Uh, so you have, a, you have a culture that is different in all of these things, child rearing practices, uh, the, they create a different world and it's the world that most of you have grown up in. In many ways it is a good world. Uh, there are certain problems with it that I'll, that I'll come to, but in most ways I wish everybody took as much care of themselves uh, physically as the new upper class does. I especially with, wish that with regard to childbearing. A characteristic of a new upper class mother is that from the moment she learns that she is pregnant, not a drop of alcohol will cross her lips. She will not be exposed to any secondhand smoke. She will monitor her weight. She will eat exactly the right foods. This is great. On the other hand, if you grow up in that world, you don't necessarily have the least idea of what the rest of America is like. And that is problematic because you are going to be the people who run the country. If you are a member of the new upper class, but you grew up in a working class or a middle class family, you don't really have a problem because you remember what it's like. You lived your childhood in other kinds of circumstances. Uh, you know what it's like uh, for people who clip uh, coupons uh, for groceries to, to go shopping because it'll save $2.50 if they spend 45 minutes clipping coupons. Uh, you understand what NASCAR is all about if you come from certain parts of the country. Uh, and and you, you understand what fishing vacations are like. Uh, not fishing vacations where you have to helicopter in, but fishing, <laughs> you know, fishing vacations in northern Minnesota, uh, and probably things like that. Now I want to come to the real problem which affects some of you in this room. What if you've always lived in that world? Here's the trajectory. You are born into an upper middle class family. You go to really good schools. You go from the really good schools to a really good college. Uh, during your summers, uh, you do not uh, get a job uh, using a jackhammer. You get an internship at AEI. Uh, you get an internship on the Hill. 
you get the kinds of internships that you guys have gotten. Uh, you, you then go on to graduate school, good graduate school, you get a good degree, and you move seamlessly into your profession, uh, never having lived in any other world throughout your entire life than this upper class bubble. I have a test in the book. A lot of you have the book, I understand. A lot of you have taken the test. Lori uh, has taken the test and scored very high. There are 25 questions on it. And, uh, you, and, and the highest scores, ha technically you could get 100 uh, or zero, but in fact the highest scores I've heard of are in the 70s, and high 70s. And the uh, lowest score, score I've heard of so far is five, which is really low. The questions consist uh, of such things as, have you ever lived in a neighborhood in which uh, more than 50% of the population of that neighborhood did not have college degrees? Uh, it, it asks a question about, have you stocked your fridge in the last year with domestic beer, and things like that. But, but there is also a question that I think is one of the most important, and one that I guess I would have each of you ask yourselves at this point. Have you ever held a job that caused a body part to hurt at the end of the day? Carpal tunnel syndrome does not count. <laughs> um, but standing on your feet, having your feet hurt because you've had to stand on your feet all day, that counts. That's good. If you have not held such a job, you are fundamentally unable to empathize with the great majority of Americans who have held such jobs and the very substantial uh, proportion of Americans who work at such jobs all their lives. You don't understand what their life is like. Um, and that should give you pause if you are going to be in a position in the future where you can affect the quality of life of the people who you are trying to help. Here's another thing to consider. If you have gone to a good private school or to a school in an affluent suburb, it is quite probable that the dumbest kid in your class was at the uh, 70th centile of uh, the IQ distribution, especially if you went to a private school. It's very likely that that's the case. What does that mean? Well, it means that you have probably never had a close personal relationship with anyone <laughs> below the national average in IQ. Now, this leads, I think, to one of the most pernicious, unconscious assumptions. I think Mayor Bloomberg, with his uh, prohibition of big gulp uh, of drinks, is a classic example of this. You know that you've been hanging out mostly with people who are pretty smart all your life. You don't know anybody who's below the, uh, the national average, and what you tend to think is those people who are below the national average must be pretty dumb. And how can we expect them to run their own lives? If you hung out with them a little bit more, you would quickly be disabused of, of that uh, presumption. People who have academic ability that uh, makes high school really hard for them can be really interesting, savvy, thoughtful people who are perfectly capable, thank you very much, of making their own decisions about how to live their own lives, and they don't need your help. But you don't know that. You want to be good. You want to, you want to do good. You want to be helpful. And there are all these people out there who are making very bad decisions. They shouldn't be watching 35 hours of television a week. Uh, they shouldn't be overweight like that. They shouldn't be doing these other things. What can we do to save them from themselves? That is a very pernicious attitude. If you're going to hold those positions, you damn well better know some people personally at a deep level whose lives you are trying to take over. There are also other problems that, that a lot of you are going to face um, that are of a much more subtle kind. Uh, and then this, well, I'll go ahead and describe it and, uh, and see where we go from there. You are, have it in your power probably to live a very glossy life. Uh, those of you who have never experienced anything except middle, upper middle class uh, affluence probably will never experience anything but that in the future. Uh, you will have jobs that you find uh, absorbing. Uh, you will marry and you will have children. You will not be engaged in many cases in the stuff of life at any deeper level than that. And by the stuff of life, I mean the things that go on 
in communities of people where problems have to be solved. And historically, that has been what America has been all about. Historically, the engagement of Americans in the life of their communities at a intimate level was taken for granted. It is one of those things that Tocqueville talked about with the greatest admiration and wonder, the degree to which Americans were constantly forming associations to solve problems, the degree to which Americans were engaged in the life of people around them. He has a wonderful quote in there about uh, the more opulent citizens of the United States take great care not to, remain, to, not to be aloof from the lower classes. They talk to them every day, and he goes on at some, at some length in that. By living in a bubble, by living in these elite bubbles, the problems that you deal with in your communities are fairly trivial. Trivial in the following sense, that, that, uh, that they, there are not very many people in that community who deeply need your help. Or there are not problems there that have to be solved because of, of a lot of personal engagement. I said it's hard to talk about this because spelling out how this works uh, in practice, if you haven't done it, is pretty hard. I, I will give you uh, just a few examples from, from my own life. In 1989, my wife and I and our two children moved from Adams Morgan to Burkittsville, Maryland. Burkittsville is a very small town. Uh, as my daughter likes to say, it has a population of 200 if you round up. Uh, <laughs> Very small town, and, and it's in a farming, rural, middle class, working class uh, community with a few oddballs like my wife and me. And my kids went to uh, the local public schools down the road six miles in Brunswick, Maryland. Again, a working class slash middle class community. So what am I talking about when I say that you lack texture in your lives? Well, it's, it's daily small things. It's, um, and, and, <laughs> Giving specific examples runs the risk of both trying to make myself sound like a good guy and, but, but here's, here's an example, okay. Uh, we had a guy who did yard work for us and uh, he got sick, got uh, very sick. And <laughs> there's no health insurance with yard work and, and, uh, and, and so his friends and neighbors, including us, we dealt with that. Now you can say, Oh, if we only had Obamacare then, or if we had a, you know, social, uh, a, a, a kind of national health insurance that other countries have, that's what would have given that man dignity. He wouldn't have had to go to his neighbors for help. Well, that's true. And I'm not talking about whether we should have uh, uh, national health care. I'm saying that what went on with that man were two things. One, he had, he's dead now, um, not because of the quality of the health care he got. Um, <laughs> He had a valued place in that community. He was not just a guy who did yard work. Everybody knew him. Uh, they liked him. They knew what was going on with his daughters. They knew, they knew what his life was like. They shared in his joys and shared his sorrows, and that included the Murrays as much as anybody else. And when he got sick, it wasn't a case of, well, I guess we got to do something to help. People wanted to help. They wanted to be engaged because this person did have a valued place. Well, you take one example like that and you multiply it by a hundred over the course of a couple of years of, of different kinds of things, large and small, and you are engaged in the stuff of life in a way which it's really hard to get engaged in if you lived in Bethesda. What does that mean for people who are interns and uh, very young in Washington as to how you go about your life in the future? See, I don't have any policy solutions for any of this. Uh, I am a libertarian, and libertarians do not do solutions. That's not, uh, that's, that's not part of our repertoire. But, but boy, do I have some solutions for you uh, that will I'm happy to uh, divulge because I've been divulging to my children now for years and years, and any time I can get a bigger audience, mm -hmm. I want to do it. You have to, you have to take a variety of steps to push yourself out of the bubble. Because even if you're like Lori and you didn't grow up in the bubble, you're pretty firmly in it now, and so you still have to do stuff too. Uh, part of this has to do with your education. 
This brings up a topic that I usually don't raise in these uh, presentations, but uh, one of the uh, guests tonight reminded me of a time when I did, and I said, yeah, I think I'll talk about this now, too. It is now possible, if you are in the social sciences or the humanities, to go from kindergarten through a PhD without ever having taken a class that you couldn't do. That's not possible if you're in uh, science or, tech or, or mathematics. At some point, if you're a mathematician, at some point in your education, you will run into a math course where you have to say to yourself, I'm just sm not smart enough to do this. You have no choice. That's a really valuable thing. Because everybody who goes through the educational access system, except you guys in science, in, in, excuse me, in, math, in, in uh, the humanities and the social sciences, everybody else hits the wall. Some kids hit the wall in grade school, and they just can't get it when the teacher tries to explain something. Some kids hit it in, in, before they get out of high school. Uh, some kids hit it when they try to go to college, and college just isn't it for them. Uh, just about everybody hits that wall, except some of you. You can do yourself an enormous favor if you are going on to graduate school by making sure that you find an instructor and find a course which is so harsh, so demanding, that you are guaranteed to be intellectually humiliated. That's what I want you all to seek as a, your goal in, in your further education. I want you to, to know at first hand what it's like. In my case, I hit the wall in uh, graduate school at MIT I, for some reason, I can't figure out why, uh, decided to take a course in the theory of matrices. Didn't have anything to, why? I mean, I did, I was doing quantitative methods, but uh, there was no reason for me to know the theory of matrices, even though they're used in statistics. So anyway, it's a very thin textbook. And I have that textbook still in my library. And if you look at it edge on, the first half of it is all dog-eared dog -eared and dark, and the second half is pristine white. <laughs> that represents the point of the course where I went to the instructor and said, I can't do this. And I understood it wasn't because I wasn't trying hard. It wasn't because the professor wasn't available and, and helpful. I just wasn't smart enough. Very valuable experience. I want all of you to cult, cultivate an opportunity to be humiliated. And if the first time you try, it doesn't work, then find somebody who's more demanding, you know. <laughs> Keep going back until you find out you aren't as smart as you'd like to think you are. Another thing that, um, that you can do is drop your plans for immediate graduate school. A lot of you are going to go on directly to graduate school. Do not. Do not do it. Unless you are absolutely sure you have a vocation. You know, if you love medicine, you've always wanted to be a doctor, sure, go right ahead to medical school, that's okay. Um, if there's something else that you're absolutely certain is your passion in life, okay. But not very many of us feel that way when we're 20, 21 years old. Most of us still, there are things we may like, a little bit better than others, uh, but we don't know yet. So first, don't go to graduate school. And second, above all, don't go to law school. And this is why I want to come back to that. This notion that the law degree is an all-purpose degree is nonsense. You are tracked into a very narrow range of occupations if you get a law degree, and you will never have a likely opportunity of exposing yourself to other things that you might like. Um, there are a whole lot of lawyers age 35 who are really, really unhappy because they went to law school as an all-purpose degree. Um, if you love the law, great. If you don't love the law, don't do it. What do you do instead? First, you get enough money together for a one-way ticket plus, let's say, a thousand bucks, two thousand if you want a little cushion, uh, and buy a one-way ticket to some place that is really exotic and that you'd like to live for a few years. And go there. Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, Zimbabwe, I don't care. Get off the plane. You can, you can go into something like Peace Corps, which is what I did when I got out of college, or you can just go on your own and get a job as a bartender or teaching English or whatever you can find, and live there for a couple of years. At least a couple, preferably three. The reason I say this is that if you stay there for three years, 
and you learn the language, over the course of that period of time, you really will have acquired an all-purpose tool. That is to say, at the end of those three years, if you haven't isolated yourself in the expat community and only hung out with Westerners, if you have lived in the country, you will have mastered not just the language, you will have mastered the subtle social cues that are going on as you walk down a street. When you are in uh, a, a situation which to most Westerners would just make their heads spin and they don't know what's going on and so forth, you will feel very comfortable and at home. And I cannot tell you the sense of self-confidence that that, that that engenders, not just in that setting, but that carries over into other settings. And I also can't describe to you the degree of satisfaction that you will feel at having been able to do that. And still another thing will have occurred, which is you will have experienced being a minority. Uh, you will know what it's like where most of the people don't have the same color skin as you do. Uh, where most of the other people have a set of values and, and religion and the rest of it which you don't share and you will have learned how to get along in that and you'll pick up all sorts of lessons which are very useful when you come back to a culture in which you are the majority for those of you in the audience who are part of the majority uh, all of this is really really useful does it have to be an exotic foreign country I suppose not but it's certainly this the the easiest way to guarantee it but you know you could probably get much the same thing if uh, if you moved to uh, Topeka, Kansas and got a job in, uh, in a local factory there or got some other kind of job. It wouldn't be as much fun from my perspective, but you'd probably, you'd probably get pretty much the same experience. But one way or another, think of your 20s, especially your early 20s, as a time in which you are exposing yourself to the kinds of things that you won't get a chance to expose yourself to once you have uh, spouse and children and the rest of it. The early 20s are the time to do that. If you're worried about delaying your career, think of it this way. If you say that the retirement age is 66, actually now you can go on interminably uh, until basically it's diagnosed Alzheimer's before anybody can fire you. But, but, well, let's, but let's, say, let's say that the, uh, and by the way, that sounds better and better to me as time goes on. But, but um, but basically, if you say it's 66, and say you start your career at 30, that gives you 36 years. Let me tell you something. If you can't make it in 36 years, you weren't going to make it in 40. <laughs> uh, and furthermore, you are going to come back to that uh, experience of, of when you start at 30, a much more mature person than if you start that career at 24, 25. Uh, well, when I went back to graduate school in, uh, at MIT, I was in the, the uh, political development field. And I was 28 at that time. I'd been uh, five years in Thailand since graduation from college. And there were lots of other guys who were my age. Again, they were guys, not girls, uh, who were doing the same thing. They'd been with USAID, or they'd been with Peace Corps. Or they'd, they were coming back after lots of field work overseas. And uh, the difference between the maturity of the graduate students who had done that and the graduate students who came straight from undergraduate school was astonishing. For that matter, the distinction between we graduate students and a couple of our professors was astonishing. I took a course up at cross-registered at Harvard. The course was in peasant politics. And so a questionnaire was handed around to the students the first session, and it had questions such as, have you ever known a peasant? <laughs> yes. Uh, it turns out the professor's entire overseas experience consisted of two months in India. And he was teaching us about peasant politics. So during the course of the semester, we'd, you'd have these guys who'd had years of experience overseas raising their hands diffidently and say, well, professor, that actually doesn't square with peasant politics that I encountered in Afghanistan or wherever. And he would assure us that that's OK, uh, that now that he knew what the theory was, he would understand why it was wrong. Um, you're a lot better off going back to graduate school, including a place like law school, if you've had that kind of experience. Well, I will, I will refrain from providing lots of other advice because you're talking, after all, to a man who uh, is in print in the New York Times advocating the, that all internships be abolished. Uh, so in that sense, I'm, I'm probably not on the same page as you in, in a lot of respects. But what I am advising should be understood clearly. I am not saying that we all ought to uh, go and help the poor. Well, I'm not saying we should, we should find the most run-down, squalid, neighborhood and live there. I am saying that the United States of America 
historically has had a civic culture that has been the wonder of the world. American exceptionalism is not something that Americans made up about themselves. It was something that foreign observers in the first century of our existence uniformly commented on. America was different, unique. And the way we were unique was in large part because even though we had rich people and poor people, there was this very strong sense that we were all Americans above all else. And those who had money, very often in the Midwest and other places, it's still true, were very careful not to behave in ways which set them apart from other people because that would be getting too big for their britches. And, and they, in, in, they, they deliberately strove to identify with other Americans because being American was much more an important part of your identity than where you stood in the social ladder in America. All of that is going away. It is drying up. And if it is to be restored, it is because people like you in this room choose to live your lives in a different way. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll have a short period of questions. We have people with mics, so if you could raise your hand and identify yourself. And at AEI, we like to at least ask you to phrase your protest statement in the form of a question before you give it. Um, that would be great. Thank you. There's a hand over there. Oh, you found Hi, one. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm interning for Senator Ayotte. And I was just wondering, um, your argument that the middle class or that the upper middle class is out of touch um, it seems like there's kind of always been an oligarchy running the country that's very out of touch with the masses that thinks that they're that popular culture is like vulgar and worthless and that they um, that they know better than the average person I was just wondering um, what makes the new upper class different than that um, other oligarchy that's kind of always been there I mean is it just that they're smarter or is it I mean, is the problem uh -huh. that there's kind of a brain drain from other communities? Um, well, well, the first thing is, I think that when you say that there has always been an upper class that uh, thought that uh, the popular culture was vulgar and so forth, a lot of what you're talking about back 50 years ago was confined to a Northeast elite. It's the families that sent their children to Groton, Groton and, and Exeter and Andover and were focused in New York, Philadelphia, and uh, Boston. And that was a very small part of the country very small proportion of the country. To, to, as more evidence for this, um, consider something like television in 1960. You had three channels. Uh, so I assure you there was no new upper, there was no upper class in the United States in 1960 of any size that didn't watch I Love Lucy. You know, it, the, there were, there were the, the, the big pro, were part of the common cultural experience. Uh, in a way that now it can't be because it's so fragmented and you have so many options. It didn't make any difference if you really yearned to see a great a dramatization of Pride and Prejudice in 1960. You weren't going to get it. But now you do have the option of tracking that down. And so, you, so what's, what's different is, in fact, that what had to be a common cultural experience in 1960 because of lack of options. Uh, now no longer has to be a common experience and you can have television programs and movies and radio programs everything that caters to niche tastes which are very different in the upper class than elsewhere in the country although i have to say there's lots of good tv and commercial tv uh, modern family it's you know terrific <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess that there's so many hands that i've i will let you we got two. We got two mics. Let's take someone from over this side, and then we'll take someone from that side, and you guys choose them. Thank you, Dr. Murray. My name is Chris Joswick. I'm an intern at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, my question, sir, relates to uh, education and how educational choice programs and options can possibly uh, change this. Your, your theory of this building class structure. How um, just touching on Milton Friedman's idea and educational choice. Thank you. Well, I'm all in favor of choice, uh, mainly because it will take give poor kids a chance 
their parents to, to get schools for them they don't have, and that is a great advantage. The problem at the upper end of the scale, though, does not lend, is not going to be affected by choice uh, immediately, because here's what happens. Parents are under the illusion that the more expensive the school, the uh, better their kids will turn out. And so the, the, the best private schools are oversubscribed, highly competitive. They now cost $30,000, $40,000 a year. And it sort of goes down the trail. But parents want to get the best possible school defined actually as one which has the smartest kids and oftentimes the richest kids in it. And that is what we have to change culturally. And a little empiricism would be a good idea in changing that too because uh, we know from everything from the Coleman Report on that the quality of the school has really very little to do with educational outcomes. And if you think this is just theory, the reason my wife and I were comfortable sending our children to quite mediocre public schools was we knew it wasn't going to make any difference in uh, how well they did academically uh, when they were going to college and so forth. We were confident that was true, and in fact it was true. Until you get parents to realize that what they are giving up uh, by not exposing their children to a broader variety is much more important than what they're gaining educationally by going to these elite schools, nothing's going to change. But I think that case can be made. I would never ever send my child to a school that wasn't safe. I wouldn't send my child to a school that wasn't nurturing, where the teachers, even if they weren't the greatest teachers in the world, weren't concerned for the students. And so, so we had that in the schools. But once you have that, it's up to the parents of the new upper class to say, what I want in my children is resilience and toughness of various kinds and a broad understanding of human beings. And I can't get that at St. Mark's Episcopal Day School. And so uh, I'm going to send them someplace else. That is a big propaganda uh, task to accomplish. Choice isn't going to help. Hello, Dr. Murray. I'm April Taylor from the Office of Senator Harry Reid. And you did mention in the beginning um, that the target was um, predominantly Caucasian. Did you in your studies? Um, talk about the um, new emerging class from diverse backgrounds? Um, to some degree. In terms of the diversity in, in uh, professional positions in the new upper class, I talked about the racial composition of the super zips and so forth. But you know my impression is that the culture I'm talking about is pretty uniform across ethnicities. Um, that when you have youngsters at Harvard who are African American and those who are Caucasian and those who are Latino, overwhelmingly <laughs> they are coming from families where dad was an attorney or a physician or a manager and the culture in which they have grown up is really pretty similar across classes. The reason I focused, let me stress once again, the reason I focused on Caucasians is because it clears away a whole lot of ways of avoiding the nature of the problem. So what I'm talking about, I think, is common across ethnicities in the new upper class. Um, but uh, it's a lot easier to describe it in terms of whites. Hmm? Hi, I'm Nicole Madden with the Heritage Foundation. You mentioned that people tend to marry into like their similar class and their similar IQ. Mm -hmm. And that's for the most part true, I've noticed in my daily life. People hang out with people they're comfortable with. Do you think that that is how it should be in order to keep fun or, uh, society functioning? Do you think that if people intermix, it's going to cause problems in the long run? Point number one is that you have to go out of your way to be around people with differing IQs because of the natural tendency to hang out with, with those who are similar to you. Point number two, though, is that uh, if you can get a socioeconomically diverse set of people, even though they all may be pretty smart, you're going to get a lot of the kind of mingling I want. And for this, I recommend, another recommendation I did not include for how you should live your lives, is that you should spend lots of time in poker rooms. Uh, my favorite poker room is the Charlestown, West Virginia casino, uh, where I spent uh, several hours last Saturday, and I <laughs> propose to spend several hours a few days from now. Um, 
where you will encounter at a single table everybody. You will have bikers with tattoos. You will have uh, uh, everybody from Croatian Americans to African Americans to Chinese Americans. You, you name it. And all, they come from all kinds of occupations. And there's a lot of camaraderie at a poker table. And there's a lot of talking, a lot of chatting. And the degree to which that represents a really enjoyable interaction with lots of people you are never going to encounter on Capitol Hill is really worthwhile. Now, I'm only being a little bit facetious about going to poker rooms. But think of the counterparts of poker rooms where you, you get out of the bubble. They do exist. There aren't very many of them, but they do exist. The church you choose uh, could have could have an effect on that. Hello, uh, my name is Eamon Buffer, and I'm from the Adam Smith Institute in London. Uh, firstly, I do agree with the new upper class about American beer. I have to say that. <laughs> uh, but secondly. Uh, what you've uh, said reminds me very much of uh, what I feel in the UK, that uh, our political class in particular are just different from the rest of the country. Do you think this is a f phenomenon that's unique to America, or do you think it's going on in every Western country? Oh, on the contrary. I think America was the last holdout. I mean, I think it's been true for a long time that French intellectuals, for example, feel much more camaraderie with German and English and Italian intellectuals than they feel with French peasants. You know, there was, in, as far as I can tell, in the French culture there is no particular reason uh, for intellectuals to want to go out and embrace uh, peasants. Uh, whereas in the United States there historically has been that kind of we're all together and there's, we don't want to make these distinctions. And God knows England uh, has, uh, the class system in England has been around for a long time. And, and so it was America that was unique. America in which uh, a lot of these class distinctions did not get in the way of a common civic culture, and now they are. I fear, much as I love England, much as I enjoy going there, uh, I don't want us to be more like England, and I think we are getting more like England in that regard. Oh, I'll let them choose. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Wendy Morris, and I was at the Summer Institute uh, this summer. I was struck by the accuracy of what you said, um, and I guess I would describe myself as maybe second generation bubble. Like, my grandparents were working class, military families, and then um, my parents, sort of beginning of the bubble. But I'm just reflecting on my own experience and the degree to which our, you know, our bubble degree. Um, really follows the religiosity of my family. And so my grandparents um, are very, very Christian. Uh, my parents a lot less so. And then my generation is very secular. Um, and so I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about the secularization or the degeneration mm -hmm. of religion, because I'm assuming that the new upper middle class, at least my perception of it, is a very secular one. Uh, the upper middle class as a whole is still, it, it, the secularization has occurred, but it hasn't occurred as much as it has occurred in the working class, oddly enough, where the bottom has fallen out of religiosity. Uh, where you get real secularization, I think, is more the kind of world that you live in now, which uh, is the world of Washington, D.C. and so forth, where the, the, the higher up you go into the rarefied uh, atmosphere of uh, the think tanks and the and the colleges and the rest of it, the more secular people are going to be. That takes away, no, let me just say, completely apart from uh, the, the, the substantive value of being of a given religious faith, it is also a very important source of community. So that when you are part of a church, an active part of a church, uh, you get a whole lot of this texture I was talking about. And, and it's very hard to come up with organizations that have that same kind of built-in clue that uh, a religious community has. I am optimistic in this regard insofar as I think that in the 21st century, um, secularism is becoming a little passe and that people are more ready to ask some fundamental questions again that have, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? What does it mean to live a good life? Uh, which I, I, I actually am optimistic that there will be a renaissance of religiosity in the new upper class once they decide that religion isn't just for dummies. 
I think we can take one more. I, 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 I have to run out, as you will see me do a disappearing act, because my wife has tickets to John Giovanni and I gotta make the uh, curtain, okay? <laughs> My name is Josh Essis, and I'm an intern at the Institute for Human Studies. You noted that an increase. Uh, Mike, a little closer to me. You noted that an increasing number of individuals of high intelligence are marrying other individuals of high intelligence. A college degree has largely become a signaling mechanism to to employers that you know you can cut it. If we could somehow remove its function as merely a signaling mechanism, do you think you would see uh, different education levels uh, marrying each other moving forward? Ah, uh, now you're talking about the topic of real education, which is the book that I published just before. And the short answer to your question is that I think the BA is the work of the devil. Um, it is a meaningless degree. If you don't know where the person went to college or what major they took, you haven't the least idea what a person who has a BA knows. Can't, you don't even know if they can write a coherent sentence. And what, what, uh, what we really need is ways for young people approaching employers to be able to take with them evidence of what they know not where they learned it and how long it took them. And for that, certifications is the way to go. Uh, that's a uh, short answer to which I actually encourage you to read Real Education because it does, it, it does talk about this at much greater length. I think we are in the middle of a BA bubble. I'm not the first person to say that. Lots of others have made the same point. It's like the housing bubble. Uh, and, it's, and at some point, people are going to say, look how much this costs and look what I'm getting for it. And um, the thing will collapse. It won't collapse at Harvard and Princeton and Yale. You know, they could charge a quarter of a million dollars per year in tuition, and they'd still have people lined up to go there because of the prestige of the places. Uh, but you talk about second tier state universities, second tier uh, private colleges, uh, they better find some other way to use those facilities because uh, the four year bachelor's degree, I think, is on its uh, way out for, for them. Well, I hope uh, I haven't been too much of a scold, uh, uh, but I hope also I've given a, for some of you a little bit of hope. I mean, how bad it can it be to uh, be told that uh, you ought to buy an airplane ticket to some exotic place and take off? Uh, but by the way, you can't use mom and dad's money to support that experience, okay? You have to support yourself while you're doing it, all right? And with that, good night. Thank you so much. We're so excited you guys could all could come here this evening and experience a great AEI event. This is just a taste of the type of events that AEI is now doing for students, both at our building here and out on your campuses. As Lori mentioned, we have a number of AEI staff members here who have blue stars on their name tags. I'd encourage you to reach out to them and learn more about the work we're doing here. AEI has a long history of producing high quality research on a number of topics and now we're ready to take it out to campuses and really try to influence the next generation of leaders. We have a number of programs including our Summer Institute, which we have two members here who are back there who did our Summer Institute last summer. It's a month long fully funded program where we bring students here to hear from great scholars like Charles Murray. We also have a great internship program and have Caitlin over here who runs our internship program. So if you're interested in interning here at AEI, please reach out to her. We also have a number of programs on campus where we we'll bring our scholars to campus or staff members to try to uh, make a difference on your campus and teach you about these different issues and how to analyze public policy. We also have a book series for college students um, and a program called Values and Capitalism. Josh Good, our program manager for Values and Capitalism in the back, um, where we're reaching out to evangelical students across the country um, to talk about values and capitalism and how they work together. Um, we'd encourage you to partner with us throughout the year on different programs on campus. And finally, actually tonight, um, we are launching a new project where we realize the debates going on right now on college campuses. There's four debates. They're all on college campuses. How many of you guys watched the first debate? Good number. <laughs> That's great to see. Um, how many times were college students mentioned in the first debate? There was one mention of recent college graduates being um, facing unemployment. We realize these are on college campuses. College students are really facing a tough, tough economy when they graduate. 
So we are soliciting questions. Um, what questions would you like to ask the presidential candidates? So tomorrow you'll get a survey of the event, which we hope you'll fill out. And we hope you'll submit your question of what, candidate, what question would you like to ask a candidate as a college student or a recent college graduate. And we'll pick the top five of those questions um, and give a prize to the winners of those, of the, the, the best five questions. So we appreciate you coming tonight. We um, have the bar open outside, food in the back. We hope you will take this opportunity to meet and talk to AEI people and staff members who are here and get to know each other. Thanks for coming.